results, so uh, we'll try to get through it. Uh, so I just want to first uh, recognize that this is a hugely collaborative effort. Um, it's expanding rapidly, um, so I wanted to acknowledge the existence and contributions of my co-authors, Tim Sheehan and uh, Joseph Lesky from No Fisheries in the USGS. Um, uh, to start with, I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview of white history around the Big 2 gene, uh, some of the context of the work, how it's come about, um, and the need for it. Uh, a really 10,000 foot overview of the modeling approach that we're using, um, and then sort of diving into the results, because that's the interesting part, um, and then talking about where we're going next. <coughs> so, uh, American Shad are anadromous, uh, and the river I'll be talking about today, uh, they are very interoperous. Very long lived compared to a lot of other populations. Uh, they have a really complex life history, uh, and as a result, they face a number of threats uh, to a number of different life history stages. Uh, so, uh, this, you know, like a lot of other anatomous fishes, has resulted in population crashes kind of brain wide. Uh, and so, uh, one real big problem that managers have facing this is that they're not listed, uh, so there's a little less teeth uh, to the kinds of things that need to be done and uh, what planning for recovery and recovery efforts are underway. So this is just to give you a look at what these, these crashes look like. Um, and you see you know, real high numbers dropping, the bottom dropping out in the late 90s. Um, we know the answer to one reason for this. Um, we know it's probably because of upstream passage issues and access to habitat, uh, but also acute mortality during downstream passage and migratory delay. Um, what we don't really know is how much how much this affects uh, these populations, and so this is sort of where this work comes in. And just to give you uh, um, you know some context, this we're not we're not inventing the wheel here. Um, it's an approach that we're starting to take through no fisheries, um, and it's kind of kicked off with some of Julie Neeland's work with Atlantic salmon in the Penobscot River. Um, some of you might be familiar with the dam impact analysis that came out of that. Uh, again, as I mentioned. Few different challenges given this isn't ESA. Uh, we also have some challenges because we know a little less about the fidelity of uh, Oboces in general with respect to their spawning, spawning sites. So with salmon, we can use really nice, simple state based projection models to get them back up into a river and do simulations. Uh, with fish like American shad, outlife, and blueback herring, uh, it's a little more difficult. And so, in order to get this recovery and management, we're developing a new suite of tools. Right now, the project is focused sort of throughout the Northeast. Um, we've got five, what we're calling tier one rivers. Um, they're not tier one because we like them best or anything like that. They just have upcoming relicensing events, negotiations are ongoing, or species protection plans are being developed in these systems based on dam removals, uh, dam relicensing, uh, pump power storage facility relicensing, um, and this sort of suite of rivers from the Connecticut in the Southwest, uh, the Merrimack, uh, Ken Beck and Andrew Scoggin, and the uh, Penobscot in Maine. And so within this, this scope, we're also starting to enjoy with looking at ideas like climate, climate change effects, uh, but also potential uh, commercial and recreational fisheries moving forward. And so to do this, uh, as I mentioned, um, talk a little bit about models today, because um, they're fun. Uh, and uh, <laughs> to do this, we're gonna use simulation models. Uh, we, they're pretty data rich for the most part. Um, we're collecting data from collaborators all up and down the East Coast. Uh, folks like ASMFC have been great points in the right direction and state agencies from Connecticut to Maine have all uh, provided input, feedback, and importantly, data. Uh, so this works as partly a projection model like your standard life history based, you know, kind of Leslie Matrix thing. Um, and then we stick this individual based migration model in there that I'll talk about a little bit. Uh, and so what we're really looking to get out of this is to be able to explain um, or predict the effects of uh, dam passage performance standards, uh, be it a rate over time or gross passage or mortality rate, on uh, the demographics of these populations through space and time. I say demographics because we're not just talking about abundance here. Uh, most of the American shad management plans along the Northeast also includes some component of preserving irreparity and um, older aged fish for various reasons, uh, one of which is resiliency. 
And so you can think of this like structured decision making model and the decisions that we're going to make are the, uh, the gross passage through dams, survival rates, and uh, time. And this is what it looks like. Uh, if you can't read it, that's okay. There's actually not any real words in here. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, and so uh, I'm just going to walk through this. It's, it's a really basic life history model uh, for what it's worth. Uh, we can start in the bottom left hand corner here. Um, in the bottom left hand corner here, we have uh, some age structure population in the ocean. We can simulate that uh, based on data we have about age structure, um, probability of uh, recruitment to virgin spawning classes, and then proportions of repeat spawners uh, thereafter. Of course, we have some information uh, on ocean mortality rates and such uh, through various stock assessments. And so this is really just our starting point. Uh, all of these things are drawn out of distributions, none of them are single values. Um, we put wide uh, uh, sort of uncertainty on this so we can incorporate the things that we don't know and how much we think we don't know. So once we have our age structure population in the ocean, uh, we take that and uh, uh, create a, a spawning population that we're then going to move into a river. Uh, based on the numbers in each age, we can assign probabilistically um, sex ratios, uh, and then based on sex ratios, things like length, mass, fecundity, um, and theoretical movement rates based on some of the work uh, that came out of the Conti lab a few years ago. Oops. And so that's when we start to move these fish into the individual based component of the migration model. Um, this is where things get a little funky, so I just want to step out um, into computer land and talk about it real quick. Um, these things, you can imagine them working like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Um, and I know it sounds kind of cheeky, but that's actually how I learned to program these. Uh, and so we have fish uh, waiting in the ether to enter the river each year. Uh, we assign them some entry date. Uh, right now, Chris, I don't know if you're still in the room, we're using temperature based on commercial harvest records in the lower Connecticut River. Uh, it's a nice tight relationship, and uh, we ask them if they're you know if they're allowed to be in the river now that uh, we have an entry date. Uh, given that they are, we can assign a terminal spawn date, also based on temperature. In this case, uh, accumulated thermal units. Um, we can ask them if they've reached the uppermost reaches of the system yet, um, and uh, if if they move you know up to or including the maximum that we're going to allow them to move in a day. And if not, if all these conditions are satisfied, then we flip a coin and see if they move. That probability of being heads to that point is based on uh, things like intrinsic motivation. That's uh, one of the things we had less data on. Uh, but more importantly, things like dam passage rates uh, and, and the like. And so given that they pass, they're allowed to move a kilometer and we start the whole thing again. So this puts us back in. Um, once we've got everybody up in the river, uh, we can spawn the fish. We're using a batch spawning model right now based on Richard McBride's work on the fisheries. Um, we're updating these with new data as they come in for the Connecticut uh, and other systems. We can then uh, put in egg cap production on uh, that the uh, juveniles that come out of that based on adult carrying capacity. Um, again, with uncertainty all built in because we don't have really good handle on some of this stuff. Um, and then we end up with some eggs, uh, some adults, and we can start moving fish out of the system. To do this, we start putting everybody back into cohorts and moving them down through the system uh, one step at a time. And this is where the downstream part of the model comes in. Uh, we have downstream passage rates, but also associated with that are natural in-river mortality rates for adults and juveniles. Um, and uh, mortality incurred as a result of delay in head bonds of dams. Beyond that, we have uh, pieces in there to account for indirect mortality of dams, uh, be it through descaling, predation, et cetera, uh, and then latent components of mortality in the estuary. That's it for the model. Uh, so here's the results. Uh, so on, on the, in the simplest sense, this is what we can do with this, right? We can project the population over time. Um, and I mentioned that there's some uncertainty in these predictions, and here I'm really trying to illustrate that uncertainty is very real. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't build a way to benefits, right? And so if you look at this graph, you have year uh, on the x-axis and population abundance, in this case, in the y-axis. In the Penobscot River, that blue line is uh, 633,000 fish. That's the recovery objective for spawners in the river. And so we can now use our projections to see uh, the probability of achieving a management goal over time, given some combination of passage rates in the river. 
And so this scenario is what happens if um, we take all the dams out of the river? Um, what do we expect this population to look like? And so we see after about 30, 40 years, um, we have a pretty high probability of achieving that management objective. And that's nice because it falls in line with previous research and previous predictions as well, um, although independent. And so one thing I want to take away here is that these various colors represent different uh, probabilities, uh, different quantiles uh, within our prediction. So you see the outermost one, that dark gray one, that's your 95% confidence limit. Um, the inner one, that uh, really light gray one, is going to be your inner quartile range. So if we think of this as the complement of the lower quartile, or quantile, we can now say that we have about a 75% probability of achieving management objectives during the next 30 to 40 years, given 100% passage, no dance. So this gives us a nice baseline to work with. It's not perfect, but it's baseline. Um, stepping up the complexity a little bit, we can now start to look at interactions between upstream and downstream passage. So the next four or five graphs I'm gonna show you all look like this. Um, there are a lot to wrap your head around, so I'm gonna take my time walking through them. On the x-axis, we have upstream passage rates. On the y-axis, we have downstream passage rates. These are varying from 50% to 100% passage. Uh, you can imagine this map as like a topographic relief map where the green is a mountain, uh, and as you fall away to the red, right, you start to be in the valleys. And so instead of elevations here, we have uh, abundance in this case of spawners after 41 to 50 years. So I'm using that time frame because that's the specific time frame in the management plan of the Moscow River. And you can see that what first thing that jumps out of me is that while wow, on that river to achieve those objectives, we need really high passage. And I mean really high passage for shad um, specifically. 90% uh, passage probability is huge for this species. Uh, the next thing that hopefully comes away from you, and I should point out uh, that that blue line on the previous graph is kind of like the yellow band in this one, right? Um, that's around where the 630,000 is. The next thing that maybe jumps out at you uh, is that we really need downstream passage. Um, and so if we go from 60% line on the y-axis and draw a straight line, you can see that population abundance increases with increasing upstream passage for a while. And then all of a sudden, if we start passing too many fish, the population abundance starts to decrease. This is because of mortality and delay occurred during downstream passage. There are a lot of dams in this system. Um, when these fish get up over too many dams and downstream passage is insufficient, then we can actually do more harm than good. This was a huge concern coming into the Penobscot that a lot of us in the modeling end of things weren't thinking about as much as the managers on the ground were. Uh, and they saw this coming. So we can do the same thing for any given age class in the Penobscot River from uh, about three to nine years old. Um, and we see these, these really coherent trends. And this makes sense. Uh, this should hold from age to age. So here's age seven uh, uh, spawner abundance in the Penobscot River. Again, you see the trade-off, and you see we really need high passage if we want to keep these fish around. Another way we can look at this is to look at the proportion of repeat spawners, the number of fish that come back to spawn every year. I should mention after we initially see the model, we're actually deriving this empirically from uh, the simulations. So these are not, um, these aren't inputs, these are outputs. And so again, x-axis upstream, y-axis downstream. And this is the opposite trend, right? Um, and so why is that? That's because passing dams hurts these fish unless downstream passage is one in terms of repeat spawning. Um, anytime they incur a percent mortality moving downstream through the river, uh, it decreases the probability of being a repeat spawner. Um, so unless downstream passage is one, this is what you're going to have. Um, Again, the, the sort of major trend that jumps out here is that while wow, upstream passage needs to be high um, to retain those repeat spawners in this system. Um, so it's neat to see that coherency across what might potentially be contradicting life history attributes that you're trying to preserve in the population. Uh, and you can see that the, uh, the downstream requirement here as well uh, becomes more stringent, right? Uh, and so the green area is good here, the red area is bad. Uh, and we're kind of blocked into a, a tighter triangle. So we can do the same thing for all these age classes, and it's coherent up to age seven, and then we get up to the really old fish in this system. Um, and here's what happens when we look at percent repeat spawners at age eight. The reason for this is that because now upstream passage becomes really important, we need to be able to overcome bulk mortality, natural mortality in this population, ocean mortality, uh, pre and post spawning mortality that are incurred naturally. And so just to achieve the numbers we need to get age eight fish, 
those passage rates need to be really high in terms of upstream. And so now you can imagine a scenario where we're starting to balance upstream passage for various um, components of management recovery objectives, right? Which is why I think this feeds nicely into that structured decision context. Um, and so there's our repeat spawners. Um, and I just kind of want to wrap this up, let you know where things are, where we're headed. Um, we've now got pretty nice working models in uh, the two largest rivers in the Northeast, the Connecticut and the Penobscot River. Um, I just actually spent yesterday and the day before uh, wrapping up revisions on the model from a group of about 30 or 40 people in the Connecticut. Um, a, a lot of experts in the field who've been huge in giving us um, really good, candid, critical reviews of the model. Uh, and we want this thing uh, to be based on, on the best, best available information. So it's been very important. Uh, the model is pretty readily adapted. Uh, river systems are a little tougher to work with these kinds of models, but it's, uh, it's nice with Shad because their main set spawners uh, with Alloy it becomes a little, uh, a little more difficult, but we're working on the preliminary models for Alloy in the Penobscot River. Uh, and hopefully what we're looking at here is sort of a standardized approach moving forward to negotiations. And so we can hand this tool off to managers. Um, we can sit down with managers in a room, uh, with industry partners and, and cooperators, um, with regulators, with engineers, uh, and these kinds of discussions that we have about this stuff. And we can, we can have a visual tool to actually talk about the importance. And a big part of this is just bringing that, um, stepping into the legalese, is bringing substantial evidence that is neither arbitrary nor capricious, right? Um, these things are based on real data, um, they're emergent patterns that we know, and we're just doing some bookkeeping on. Um, and hopefully this provides a really strong quantitative tool. Uh, it's taken a little bit of time to build that support network. Um, it's really difficult to go through, you know, a thousand lines of R code with um, a fish manager who comes at things from an engineering perspective. Um, we put that time in, and we're still putting that time in on the ground. Um, this has been huge. We, we couldn't do this without the network of professionals that we had involved with this. Uh, one, we would never have the data, but two, this thing would never get trashed and get off the ground. Um, so we're, identi we're identifying some really important considerations with these models. I'll show you a few examples of trade-offs. Things look different in the Connecticut River. We've got a pump power facility up on the top of that system um, with a different age structure. And so we're, we're identifying these important considerations, and along those lines, as we heard about yesterday, we're starting to identify the really important sensitivities in these models. Um, the things that our predictions and our, our management decisions are most sensitive to. Those pieces of life history, uh, 